In the continuation of chapter 12, we're going to take a look at why some things form solutions. Uh, yesterday, we looked at our standard solutions of two different liquids mixed together. Today, we're going to look at how different solids and gases behave uh, once they're in solution. Major announcements for this week, chapter 17 and chapter 12. Homework will be due Sunday, August 2nd at midnight. Uh, we're going to finish chapter 12 today, and then on Wednesday, we're going to start organic chemistry. Uh, we'll talk about organic chemistry on Thursday as well, and then seeing how far we get, maybe a little bit on Monday. And I would like to get to modern materials a little bit next week. So the key to understanding if something's going to form a solution, a homogeneous solution, if two different liquids will uniformly mix together, uh, one thing that a chemist will often say is like dissolves like. And by that, they mean we want to have two things that we're mixing together have similar intermolecular forces, similar polarity. Um, and be, if those molecules have similar intermolecular forces, similar polarity to each other, it's very likely that they will form a homogeneous solution. And so that example here on the left, we have heptane and pentane. Heptane and pentane will form a homogeneous solution because both display London dispersion forces. So like dissolves like. Both of those molecules are nonpolar. They're only carbon and hydrogen. And because of that, they will be miscible. They will mix together. The next example, I've got two polar molecules, acetone and chloroform. Again, both of those demonstrate London dispersion forces, but more importantly, both also demonstrate dipole-dipole moment. Because of that, they will mix together. They will be miscible and form a homogeneous solution. Similarly, I could look at a sample of ethanol and water. Both of those have the capability of hydrogen bonding because they're both having similar polarity, similar intermolecular forces of similar strength. They would also form a homogeneous solution. And then for the ion-dipole interaction, I need an ion in solution. I need a molecule with a dipole. Well, sodium's my ion and water is my dipole. Well, what about heptane and water? Heptane is just C7H16, so it's just carbon and hydrogen, it's nonpolar, and water is a very polar molecule. Would those two form a uniform homogeneous solution? Well, the answer is no, because if we look at heptane, heptane only has London dispersion forces, whereas water, sure, water has some London dispersion forces, it has dipole dipole forces, and it also has hydrogen bonding forces. Water is very polar, and that makes it drastically different than heptane. And as a result, they do not have similar intermolecular forces, and they will not form a homogeneous solution. Because think about it, in that sample of water, if I have a sample of water, I would have to break all those dipole-dipole forces, I would have to break all those hydrogen bonding forces and replace them with what? Replace them with London dispersion, London dispersion forces, because those are the only intermolecular forces that heptane has available. Because those are incredibly weak force, right, why would water break strong intermolecular forces to replace it with a weak intermolecular force? We'd have to put in a lot of energy to break those intermolecular forces, and that energy will not be returned when we, re when we break those strong intermolecular forces and replace it with a weaker London dispersion forces. So the answer is no, right? Because heptane and water, essentially oil and water, are drastically different with respect to polarity and intermolecular forces. Water is very polar, heptane is nonpolar. And so here's a similar trend here, right? Going back to the like dissolves like with respect 
to polarity. Right, polar substances will tend to dissolve in polar solvents. Nonpolar substances will tend to dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Methanol. Methanol is very polar because it has the hydroxyl group. Right here, I have the hydrogen bonding capability. So methanol is infinitely soluble in water. I could even go up to ethanol and propanol because I still have that hydroxyl group. I still have the capability of hydrogen bonding, and those as well are infinitely soluble in water. But something happens between propanol and butanol when I add one more carbon to this chain between propanol and butanol. Sure, I still have the hydroxyl group. I can still hydrogen bond, but now I have this longer carbon-carbon chain that is nonpolar. The longer that chain gets, the more that, that carbon tail is going to determine the properties of this molecule. And that carbon chain is nonpolar. So we see the solubility of these alcohols decrease in the polar solvent of water. The solubility of these alcohols decreases because they're becoming less and less polar the longer that carbon chain gets. And so as we go from butanol to pentanol to hexanol, each of those I'm adding one more carbon, right? One more nonpolar carbon that's decreasing the polarity overall of the molecule and decreasing how similar that is to the solvent of water. I notice the opposite trend over here with hexane. Hexane is just CH3, CH2, CH2. So that is nonpolar, right? Hexane is much different than water. It is nonpolar, just carbon and hydrogen. So these long tails on hexanol, pentanol, and butanol, right? Those alcohols are infinitely soluble in hexane. Because if we look at the similarity, we look at the similarity in structure, right? I've got this long carbon chain. That long carbon chain in hexanol is very similar to the long carbon chain I have in hexane. So nonpolar, nonpolar, they're similar, and they will be infinitely soluble in each other. The only one that stands out is the methanol, and that's because the methanol, I have this hydroxyl group that's hydrogen bonding. It's very polar. Methanol is incredibly polar. Hexane is nonpolar. Because the two molecules are drastically different with respect to their polarity, right? they are not really soluble in each other, or I guess we could say slightly soluble in this case. So like dissolves like with respect to polarity. We are looking for molecules of similar polarity, whether it's polar or nonpolar, to make a uniform homogeneous solution. And so really what we're looking at and what we're trying to analyze is that in order for something to come together and form a homogeneous solution, we have two factors at play, right? When I mix two different solutions together, I'm naturally increasing the entropy. So that's, that's favorable. I want to increase the entropy for something that happens spontaneously. I need to increase the entropy for something that happens spontaneously. So that's factor number one. Making any solution does that. It increases the spontaneity by increasing and mixing two different things together. The second problem I have to overcome is that basically I need to replace the intermolecular forces right, that I had with the solvent with new intermolecular forces with the solution. And if I'm not going to be able to replace those with similar energy, it's not going to form a solution. Or if I have to break really strong intermolecular forces and replace them with weaker intermolecular forces, right, again, it's not going to form a homogeneous solution. So if I have really strong intermolecular forces within the solute, right, that's going to make it harder for that to go into solution because those strong intermolecular forces are going to hold the solute together and prevent it from going into solution. Whereas if I have stronger, if I can form stronger intermolecular forces between the solute and the solvent, right, that's a great way to form a homogeneous solution. 
because that's gonna be a great way to form a lot of favorable interactions when I mix those two together. So I need to look at both components. What's the entropic component from mixing two different things together, right? That's always gonna be a benefit. The second component that's gonna limit if a solution forms or not will be the energy. What are the intermolecular forces I'm breaking? And what are the intermolecular forces I'm replacing them with? If I'm breaking strong intermolecular forces and can only replace them with weak intermolecular forces, it's not going to form a homogeneous solution. So if anyone's ever looked at a container of salad dressing, right, you've seen that factor at play. And so if you look at that salad dressing, right, we have the oil layer on top and we have the water layer on the bottom. That does not form a homogeneous solution for the exact same reason that hexane does not mix with water, right? The oil is incredibly nonpolar. The water is incredibly polar. So these two do not mix, and you can even see that in this globule here of oil, that globule of oil. Sure, I can, I can stir it up, I can shake it up very vigorously, but if I let it sit and settle, it'll phase separate. And I'll get the oil layer back on top and the water layer back on, on the bottom. And we can see those intermolecular forces at play within that globule of oil right here because I've got stronger intermolecular forces, right, holding that oil droplet together because it's not able to interact with the water, right? Because the water is very polar, it has hydrogen bonding, oil only has London dispersion forces available to it. And so it would rather maximize the intermolecular forces within that sample of oil and not interact with the water. And that's why we see two distinct phases in this solution. Whereas if we were to look at a sample of a beer, for example, or a glass of wine, right, that's a homogeneous solution because we're replacing similar intermolecular forces. In that sample of beer or wine, right, we have our water, and we have our ethanol. Our water is H2O, and our ethanol is CH3, CH2, OH. Both are capable of hydrogen bonding, and so because of that, they can form a homogeneous solution because I could form hydrogen bonds between two ethanol molecules, or I could switch that hydrogen bond between two ethanol water molecules, and I could switch it with an almost identical hydrogen bond between a water molecule and an ethanol molecule. Because I can form similar intermolecular forces between that, those two species in the solution, I'm able to form a homogeneous solution. I'm able to maximize the hydrogen bonding interactions because both molecules can participate in hydrogen bonding. I can form a homogeneous solution because I can simply switch the hydrogen bond between two ethanol molecules with a hydrogen bond between ethanol and a water molecule, right? Those are both equal strength interactions, right? So I'm not going to lose anything during the course of making this homogeneous solution. So here's a question for you. Glucose is on the right and... Why is that soluble in solution when cyclohexane, which is on the left, is not soluble in solution? So the answer to that question comes from the hydroxyl groups, right? The hydroxyl groups, these are all positions where I can hydrogen bond with water. One, two, three, four, and five hydroxyl groups on glucose. Because I have five different places to hydrogen bond with water, I'm going to be more soluble in water. So glucose has many points for hydrogen bonding interactions which will make it more water soluble. Whereas cyclohexane, just carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen is nonpolar. And because cyclohexane is nonpolar, it's just got London dispersion forces, right? 
and that won't allow it to interact with water. It will not be soluble in water. This also plays an important role in determining the solubility and why some vitamins we need to take on a daily basis or some vitamins we do not have to be concerned with. And so uh, vitamin A, which is also retinol, if we look at retinol, we have this long carbon chain, just carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen. So we could look at that molecule and say the majority of that molecule, right, 95% of that molecule is just nonpolar carbon and hydrogen. Because it is nonpolar, right, it's very similar to the fat molecules that we store. And because it's very similar to fat, it's not soluble in water because it's nonpolar. Because it's not soluble in water, it's easy to store in our body, right? It's harder to get rid of retinol. Whereas if we look at vitamin C, and so if you're familiar with ever hearing of scurvy and why sailors who were sailing across the Atlantic needed to bring things like grapefruit and oranges with them, because vitamin C, if we look at vitamin C, we've got many hydroxyl groups, one, two, three, four hydroxyl groups. And we even have other polar moieties here that allow it to have dipole-dipole interactions as well as hydrogen bonding interactions. And because of that, vitamin C is very polar. And because it's very polar, it's very water-soluble. It's very easy to get rid of. And because it's easy to get rid of, right, it's something you should consume on a daily or every couple of day basis to make sure that you have enough vitamin C. So here's my question for you. Arrange these substances in order of increasing solubility in water. We've got A, B, C, and D. We want to go from least soluble to most soluble. All the way up to most soluble in water. So the least soluble would be A. Because A is simply just carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, so it's nonpolar. And because it's nonpolar, it'll have London dispersion forces only. So the least soluble molecule is A. The next would be D. Because D, it's a little bit more soluble than A because I've got at least one polar bond, right? This one bond is polar, and so maybe I have some dipole-dipole some interactions with water. After that, I would expect to have C be next in solubility because now I've replaced that carbon-chlorine bond with the carbon-hydroxyl group. Now I can have hydrogen bonding interactions with water. So that's going to help increase the solubility. And as you may have guessed, right, B would be the most soluble because now I have two hydroxyl groups. So now I have two different points where I could hydrogen bond with water. Right, increasing the solubility even further. So the correct answer would be A is least soluble, followed by D, C, and then B. Up to this point, we really haven't talked about the impact that pressure has on the solubility, and that's because if we change the pressure, it doesn't really change the solubility of a liquid or a solid. However, we can change the pressure to influence the solubility of a gas. So the solubility of a gas increases with pressure. And we all know this because you've all opened up a soda at one point in time. And as soon as you open that soda, right, you're opening up that soda to the surroundings and you're automatically decreasing the pressure that was in that container. And the first thing that happens is that carbon dioxide bubbles to the surface and fizzes out of that soda. So we've decreased the pressure by opening that container and what happens, right, carbon dioxide gas escapes from solution. Because within the container, we were previously at a higher pressure than atmospheric pressure. So in general, as molecular weight increases, right, so does our solubility. And that's because even for things like gases, even things we don't think of being very soluble in solution, 
as we increase their molecular weight, we're increasing their solubility because we are increasing the London dispersion forces that we have, right? Larger molecules have more electrons, more electrons lead to more London dispersion forces. So in general, right, we could also just increase the size of the molecule. That would increase its solubility by increasing London dispersion forces. We can also use the pressure, especially for gases, and that's Henry's Law. Henry's Law dictates that the solubility of a gas equals the partial pressure of the gas times Henry's Law constant, which is K, for that gas. So as I increase the partial pressure of that gas, right, I'm increasing the solubility of that gas. Those two are directly related. Or if I were to decrease the partial pressure, I would decrease the solubility of that gas. And that's the example that I mentioned before of here are all the CO2, right, that's in solution. And maybe in this bottle I have four ATM pressure. As soon as I open that molecule up, right, outside I have one ATM pressure, so I'm automatically going to decrease the pressure and as soon as that happens, CO2 is going to rise up and out of solution until I reach equilibrium where the pressure in here, right, is equal to the pressure out here. So one ATM pressure. But that initial change in pressure of the gas is going to decrease the solubility of that gas until I reach equilibrium. And that's why we see the first time you open up a soda... Right, we see those bubbles form, we see the carbon dioxide leave the solution. Right, the next time you open up the soda, it's a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less because you're each time you're getting rid of more carbon dioxide. So here's a sample question for you. The solubility of argon at one ATM pressure is 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. What is the solubility when the pressure is increased to 3.2 ATM? And I've even provided the Henry's Law equation for you. So in this calculation, we actually have to do two calculations because the one thing we do not know is the constant for argon. We do not know the solubility constant for that. So we know that the solubility under these conditions at one ATM pressure, right, standard temperature and pressure, Solubility is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 3, and that is, I don't know the constant, but I do know that occurs at 1 atm pressure. So I'm going to divide both sides by 1 atm pressure, 1 atm, and so not some very challenging math there, but that'll leave me with my solubility constant for argon of approximately 1.3 times 10 to the minus 3 molar per atm. Now the second part of this calculation, there was part 1. Part 2, I have to do the same calculation except for now I'm under a higher pressure condition. So what is the solubility of argon? at 3.2 atmospheres. Well, I know the solubility constant for that gas is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 3 molar per atm. And now I'm at 3.2 atm pressure. So I multiply atm cancel it out, and the new solubility of argon at this higher pressure is actually 4.2 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. So the reason why I had to do both of those calculations, I had to use the same equation twice, was because I only knew pressure and solubility. I did not know the solubility constant. And because that solubility constant is good for the temperature where this is done, I could use that solubility constant under the higher pressure conditions to find what is the new solubility of this gas under these conditions. In general, we can also change the solubility of something by increasing the temperature, right? Everyone's familiar with this because if you're trying to get something in the solution, as you warm the solution, right, in general, solids will increase their solubility. So if you're trying to dissolve sugar 
in water, it helps to warm that sugar up and stir things around that'll increase the solubility. So the general trend for our solids is that as we increase the temperature of the solvent, right, in general, the solubility of those solids increase. And we can see some things are quite exponential, like calcium chloride is very exponential in its solubility, whereas sodium chloride is relatively flat in its increase in solubility as a function of temperature. Gases, however, behave in the opposite direction. As I increase the temperature of the solvent, right, actually the solubility of a gas decreases. And that's what we see here as I increase the temperature of that solvent, the solubility of these gases decreases. So methane, oxygen, carbon monoxide, helium. So as water temperature rises, right, solubility of a gas decreases. And that example is if you open your soda and then leave the soda on the countertop and let it warm up, or do you open your soda and then put it back in the fridge when you're done? If you store that in the refrigerator, right, you're maximizing the solubility of that carbon dioxide, and you're going to maximize how long that soda will keep its carbonation for.